Well, good afternoon. Thank you, Dean Gabriel, for such a nice um, introduction. And I want to thank you all for uh, coming and being here with me and letting me share with you kind of my story and hopefully get you excited about what's in front of you. Um, it's wonderful to be here. I mean, I look at this audience and I think about this is our next generation of highly skilled workforce. Um, and when I read about all of you as students, especially the freshmen, and I think sophomores and seniors and juniors, I'm not sure how, what the collection is. I know I've got a lot of freshmen here because you have to be here. But your remarkable math SAT scores of 670 to 750, wow, let alone your outstanding SAT scores are just outstanding. Uh, it's a good thing we're not here to talk about my college entrance scores because they weren't anything like that. But I'm feeling good about our future. That's really excellent. And I just hope you guys get excited about what you have in front of you because it is wide open and we need your talent. Um, so let me first start with a congratulations because I believe you have made the right investment and you're investing wisely in the right discipline and a solid educational foundation that will open the door for you. An engineering expertise that you're developing will perfectly position you to create your dream come true or develop that dream as you go through your training and start opening the doors that are in front of you. And I believe there's no better place than Villanova to actually get that education. Um, I have not been here before, but just the short tour that I've gotten today and reading about the university and understanding the opportunities that are here for you to enrich your uh, learning is incredible. The very commitment of the school, which is perfectly described in the two words, ignite change, is all about the spirit of discovery, about creation, about the application of knowledge, about igniting the heart, inspiring the mind, and illuminating the spirit, as perfectly stated by your president, Father Donahue. So today, my goal is to really help you get revved up about the future. Because when you're here, your years are going to fly by you. And so just as I walked on the campus today and had a chance to kind of think about my days at school, a lot of the same memories came back to me. The endless nights of studying, day in and day out. The late nights cramming for that critical assignment that was due. Cramming for finals, which I think is a few days, uh, maybe a week away, and I'm sure you guys are finishing up your last uh, minute projects. Trying to get my lab work to, to get completed working on my computer program. During my time at school, it was punch card. So if you dropped and you're really in a mistake. And then racing across the campus to take that class that you had to take that I had no interest in but was required for credit. But of course, change, finding the time to really make time to meet new friends, spend some time outdoors, and really enjoy the enrichment of this learning experience that you have in front of you. These were whirlwind days, I remember. They were filled with adrenaline, all kinds of junk food, pizza, late night, um, but finally the excitement and yes, the anxiety of that time when graduation was right there in front of you. These years go by quickly, so my recommendation for you is to plan, to pace, to prepare, and yes, play appropriately. And getting that balance is key. But trust me, you will get off kil kilter every once in a while but hopefully not as far as I did, and I'll explain that a little bit later in my, my talk. I chose the doors engineering can open as the theme for my talk today because I thought it captured the words of excitement that I hope you're seeing here at college. Plus, it's your once-in-a-life opportunity that's standing right in front of you, and there are so many doors that are available to you as an engineer. To be clear, I had no idea where my career would take me. And there's no way I could have ever plotted that path of where my career would go. But what I want to share with you and reinforce with you today is you have an exciting future in front of you. It's your time. And I can also say with confidence, you're better equipped than any other discipline on this campus to embrace and advance your dreams given your strong technical and engineering foundation that you're building. But it will require hard work. It's going to require courage confidence, and lots of persistence, because it's not an easy discipline. Today I want to share with you five reflections from the critical lessons that I've learned in my engineering leadership journey, in hopes that it helps you to start preparing to open in those doors that are right in front of you. First, 
push yourself. Never stop learning and give yourself the freedom to try new things. Two, build confidence and courage, yet you must be a team player. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Three, make engineering your powerful advantage with two additional skills. And I think the university here is set up perfectly to help you do that. Entrepreneurship and creative storytelling. It will determine how fast and how far someone's career will advance. Four, stay in your rookie mode. That stretch feeling that really produces your greatest work. And five, find meaning in what you do. Make it matter. That higher purpose really brings that energy alive and allows you to really get excited and motivated in your day-to-day -day activity. This is a painting of astronaut John Young, and it was painted by an artist, Henry Caselli. It's called When Thoughts Turn Inward. And it shows John Young in the moment of reflection as he prepares for the first launch of the space shuttle. As mentioned, I worked at NASA in my earlier career, and exploring the unknown and finding solutions have always been my passion. That's the reason why this painting resonates so deeply with me. It gives such insight to what it means to take great challenges, to explore uncharted territories, to lead. At the time this was painted, John Young didn't know what lay ahead. It was the first space shuttle mission and had never been tested. There were people concerned that the ship would never make it back. But when the lights were turned on and John was facing the public, John exuded confidence, unbeatable spirit, unbreakable courage. And anyone who knows John Young, like I got the opportunity to know and work with, you know what I'm talking about. Yet this painting shows his other side, his private side, his humanity, his quiet but sense, um, strong sense of purpose. Each of us will have moments of doubt and anxiety, whether we're blasting off into space or we're trying something new out of our comfort zone. And I know I've had my sense of anxiety in several of the actions and, and new jobs that I've taken and new activities. And I'm sure you'll experience this if you haven't already today. In fact, many of you may be dealing this, with this today as you face new and progressively challenging classes, as you face midterms around the corner, your first research project, your first internship, your first job. But I truly believe that it's the tension between the butterflies in your stomach and the confidence in your stomach that produces our greatest work. It's the determination to work through that uncertainty, that stretched feeling that keeps us going forward and gives us the energy and the focus to accomplish feats we never thought possible. When I arrived as a student um, on my freshman year, I didn't exactly put my nose to the, night, to the, to the um, grindstone. I spent a lot of time outdoors hiking and skiing, meeting new friends, enjoying the Greek system. I, I honestly was having a lot of fun, but I wasn't focused on school, which led me to losing my scholarship my first year. Not a good day, not a good discussion with my dad. And then something happened. I took my first mechanical engineering class the spring of my first year at the University of Utah. While I love math and science, I wasn't really sure I wanted to be an engineer and I wasn't sure that was the path for me. That spring, my professor, Dr. DeVries, opened my eyes. He reinforced what my father had been trying to tell me for years. Imagine that. Who would have ever thought that a professor who, who taught about his stories of growing up on a farm would have such a profound impact on me? His real life stories came alive, not the theories, not the equations, when he shared, he shared his humorous stories about being on a tractor and having to deal with a failed engine or a sheared um, drive shaft and how it was wasting away a beautiful day and that he'd have to work that much harder on the farm once he got it fixed. Dr. DeVries showed us the what, not only the what and the how, but he really showed us why, why it mattered. And that resonated to me. I remember thinking to myself at that time, I may not like studying, but I love learning, and I love looking at life through an engineer's eye. And I can still tell you, that's what inspires me each and every day. I'd like to see you guys all use your time between now and when you graduate to really broaden your thinking, to expand your view of engineering, to develop your interests, 
as there's so many opportunities available for engineers. There's a number of different jobs out there, number of companies, many you've never heard of, but they all have a great need for engineering. And there's so many different engineering jobs and roles that you can take that it's important that you think about what your interests are so you can start plotting out that direction of where you want to go. It's so much broader than I thought it was when I was sitting in the shoes of you guys at this point. And my career truly opened up the possibilities of what engineering will allow you to do in the future. How many of you know who Booz Allen is? Any of you? Okay, a few hands. Not many, though. How many of you know who Amatech? Headquartered right down the street. I'll talk a little bit more about it. How many of you know of who Bort Longyear is? Xylem, we talked about. It was a company I ran. Honeywell. I think you all probably know NASA, correct? But I would argue many of you don't know our nation's space strategy. I know I clearly don't know it, and it's probably something we can talk a whole other lecture on. But my point is, get to know the different companies out there. While you're studying and you're getting yourself to, ed to graduation, take as much time thinking about how do I think about the jobs and where my career wants to go. I mentioned different jobs and different um, roles that an engineer can have. I know many of you are thinking about a designer, a researcher, maybe running a technology company. But think about technical sales. Think about manufacturing operations. Being in the supply chain, you have to have technical engineering skills to be able to do that. Environmental safety and health. And then as you progress in your career, getting into general management, getting to run a business. But there's, those are just to name a few of the jobs that are available to you and spend some time thinking about it. Let me just take my point a little bit further and talk about two of the boards I'm on today to just expand a little bit more on what I'm talking about. Am Amatech. As I mentioned, Amatech is a global technology and manufacturing leader in electronic instrumentation and electromechanical devices. It's headquartered right down the road in Berwyn, so not far from here. Now, it's manufacturing technology companies you'll see not only in the U.S., but around the globe. This is a great and global company that is just moved into the S&P 500 because of its solid performance and its strong growth. This is a company where you can, as an engineer, develop a very deep knowledge in electrical or mechanical technology and not only have the deep technical knowledge, but you'll get the opportunity to work across a number of different markets and to understand different industries and different markets and how your technology can be applied. So you're thinking about strategies around advanced monitoring, around testing, calibration, um, display, instrumentation, all required in this data-driven world. A great opportunity for an engineer. Not only, as you can see, it's in different industries, but here you also get to be working for an engineer that is an engineering-driven company. And so almost every job in the company is an engineering opportunity. So it gives you the opportunity and the freedom to try something new and to expand yourself and try the different disciplines and broaden your toolbox. The other thing that I think is exciting about it is you're a technology company and what you're doing is you're advancing technology by bringing, bringing to market new differentiated products, expanding your marketplace by actually acquiring other technology companies, and also using that technology to make yourself more efficient and more effective in your manufacturing operations. So you're applying it in everything that you do. Amatech, as you can see in the lower right-hand column of the, of the chart, is performing fantastically. So not only do you get to work for a company that is trusted and known by its customers, but the investor base loves it, and you're going to make some money while you work there. Let me talk about one other company, Booz Allen & Hamilton, a 100-year-old company, which is a leader provider in, manufact I mean in, uh, in, in uh, management and technology consulting services. And they're really known for their time um, with the U.S. government, but they've expanded much broader than that. They are helping Fortune 500 companies and non-profit uh, non organizations globally. You'll see them doing mission-critical work across the globe. Booz Allen's known for really partnering with their customers, bringing highly um, trained experts and engineers that are deep in knowledge around cybersecurity protection, in 
cloud computing in science data, or I should say data science in system delivery. I got the opportunity to work with Booz Allen when I was on the space program. Their systems delivery and program management skills were second to none. And so they were our partner when I worked at NASA in terms of delivering the International Space Station. I highlight this chart and show you some of the projects that they're working to show you the diversity. But let me just pull out the top center um, and, and expand a little bit more than that. The Major League Baseball turned to Booz Allen um, in 2014 to really design the, re, the replay command control center. If you remember, baseball obviously calls that uh, were questioned and so forth. They wanted a command center that was foolproof, that was at the standards that were military grade, no fail command and control operations that are basically being used in our, across our country for some of our most adversaries. And so they turned to Booz Allen, who was very well known in the intelligence and in the military world, and they're now expanding themselves out globally. And the reason I bring this to your attention is what a great opportunity to work for a company and see diversity in what you do with your clients. So with that as a background, let me segue into my first, my first reflection on my journey. First, push yourself, never stop learning, and give yourself the freedom to try something new, to take a different path if that's what it takes. During my first summer internship at Hercules Aerospace, which today is now ATK, Orbital ATK, after my sophomore year, I started with your typical mechanical engineering internship role. I was plotting stress and strain, analyzing the results, and ultimately giving that important information to the professional engineers. No computers at the time. We were using a ruler. We were building spreadsheets. And it was pretty boring. And so I was determined to finish that task that summer well ahead of time that I could go ask for a more important job. Well, I got the job done. I asked, and I got another job, but it came with one big hitch. I had to work for my father, my father who was the chief engineer at Hercules. The project they were working on was a real-time problem, and they needed some additional help, someone to gather information and so forth. But what they were really trying to do was to deal with an important missile program that had an issue. To put it in con context, the problem that they were faced with was that if they couldn't resolve the issue, the Department of Defense was faced with actually having to go pull fielded missiles in the ground out around the world in the concern that there was a failed O-ring. And so my job was to determine if the O-ring was, was damaged or not and really collect the data. And so my day spent was collecting information and providing that to my father and his engineers so they could determine the right fact-based recommendation to take forward to the customer. My job would start every day because I was living at home that summer doing my internship and I would drive to work with my dad. Every day there was 100 questions in the car. What are you going to do? Who are you going to talk to? What data are you going to collect? Why? What about this? and the questions would go on until we'd pull into the parking lot and I'd go off to my job. And that would drive my day of what I was doing. I'd get back in the car to go home and it was all the questions of, what did you find out? Why do you think that's the right answer? Have you thought about this? Did you talk to this person? And it would go through dinner until my mother would finally say, enough, I've heard enough. At the time, I truly dreaded the questions, but looking back, that experience was so invaluable to me it taught me that I owned an important part of a very big decision. And I had to be confident, I had to challenge myself, and I had to be methodical in my thinking and in my research because I was the one responsible for making sure that the data they got was correct. They were making the decision, but the data I was collecting was essential for them to make that right fact-based decision. You know, the other thing I learned at that point in time, though, which was probably most valuable, is that I really learned that I got excitement about really working with other people and really seeing the bigger picture and connecting the dots and being part of a big decision that needed to be made. And so that kind of helped me think about where I wanted to go in my career. So from that summer forward, seeing the big picture, applying technology, and finding solutions became my passion. And after I graduated, I began to build a career that allowed me to focus just on that. As I, as I stated, I had no idea where it would take me, 
but it led to me with jobs to working in the public and private sector, experiences as diverse as building the International Space Station, to running a global engineering organization, to running my first profit and loss um, part of a business, to then spinning off from a big conglomerate um, and being able to run a global water technology company in the S&P 500. It truly has been a dream come true. I would have never imagined and plotted it out the way it's happened. But I will tell you, my learnings came from the diversity in my career, from the number of new adventures I took on, always being stretched and making me rely on my curiosity of learning, which really included reading, asking, trying, yes, failing, and succeeding as I went along. And it also included watching and observing other leaders, leaders I wanted to be like, but I will tell you, I learned more from leaders I didn't want to be like. And I applied that in terms of my leadership skills and how I was acting as a person. My next experience was with, with NASA, and it provided really the perfect platform for me to gain the breadth of understanding of integrated technology and really all about program management. Uh, the opportunity to help design and build the International Space Station was just an amazing opportunity. You know, here again, I was applying my love for the unknown and finding solutions to be able to bring this international endeavor alive. And I started out as a weights engineer. Not very glamorous or exciting at the time, but it was my entry ticket to the program, and I had a passion for space. However, in hindsight, it was the ideal position to be in because it gave me the full view of the space station configuration. Because as you know, when you're building a space station, it takes many years, many missions, and at each step of the way, it required leaving a sustainable spacecraft in orbit. And with the responsibility to ensure that each space mission was designed to meet the, the right weight requirements, and also making sure that the space shuttle bay had the right mass properties, not only when it launched, but during the assembly, while, we while we were docking and unassembling the equipment, and while we were also um, making sure that we could bring it back and leaving the space station correct. I had a view of the space station that no one else ever really got to see, or very few people. I got to see every mission. I knew what the integrated power system looked like. I knew what the data management system like. I knew what the robotics actions were going to be. And it was just a, fa a fascinating um, opportunity. But with that said, I was not an expert in any one field. I had a unique systems view that allowed me to expand my knowledge quickly and allowed me to see the importance and the basic skills of really managing groups of related projects. It connected me with all of the experts in their disciplines, and it truly opened my eyes to program management. When you're working a very complex problem like this, you have to be able to connect the dots, you have to be able to understand the critical path, and you also have to make sure you're organizing and managing work at levels that you can get something accomplished. This was an experience that was fun, but it was also as challenging as I've ever seen a, a, a problem be. It was ever-changing. If it wasn't NASA changing the design, it was the Europeans changing the design, or it was the, or the Russians changing the design. Or if it wasn't our funding issue, it was the Japanese who were now having a, a funding issue. But we learned to work together, and it ultimately allowed us to build an international space station. I will tell you, though, that these skills that I learned at that time as a weights engineer have been invaluable in my career. And I believe they were the reasons that many doors opened for me, both at NASA, further on, and then ultimately in my career um, as I moved forward. I'd like to just touch on, a, I'll, uh, what I'll, I'm going to do is transition out of NASA, but I will come back and talk a little bit more about some of my other NASA stories. But I left NASA in 1999 right after the first success of several launches of the International Space Station program. To my point of trying new things, I always had the dream of running a business for profit. And so with the success of Space Station and our first couple of elements, it was the perfect time for me to think about maybe there was something else. And of course, I was actually approached by several companies to come work for them. 
I didn't take the job that most people thought I would. I think most people thought I would move into one of the big aerospace primes. But I actually took a different job, and it was a job that required me to actually take a lateral step first before running that P&L that I wanted to do. But it was probably the smartest decision I made. It allowed me to step off of NASA from my strengths of program management and come into an organization, learn the rhythm of the business, learn their processes, and ultimately learn the people and how it worked and operated. It actually then allowed me then to move into um, a position of uh, leadership and into running a business later on. But I will tell you, it also opened up doors that would allow me, if I ever wanted to get out of aerospace, which I ended up doing, those opportunities. I actually went to work for Allied Signal, which today is known as Honeywell. Two years later, after I had been there, the CEO of aerospace told me that when he hired me, that his boss, the CEO of Honeywell, had sent him a letter the day that I had arrived. And he said, you'll have to watch Gretchen very closely. I'm not sure she has the ability to make the shift from government to a for-profit co corporation. And that he needed to watch me. So what he was calling me in two years later, me not knowing the story, saying, you passed the test. But I will tell you, from that day that I started, the CEO of Honeywell would call me periodically, and he would test my leadership skills and push me in a way of teaching me, but it was good. It kept me on my toes. And I also knew when I had left the government to go work for a profit company, that that was one of the things I needed to develop. My business acumen, get stronger in my financial acumen so that I could be a business leader and I could be successful. And so I did go to work on day one. And probably one of the things that I would, I would recommend to all of you is to partner with your other functional um, colleagues that are deep in a different expertise. I partnered and spent a lot of time getting advice from some of the other strong, talented financial leaders. And it was asking advice and asking them how did they see things through their financial eye versus how I thought of things from my engineering eye. And I will tell you today, I'm a better engineering leader and a better general manager because of it. And so before I go into my second reflection, I want to um, highlight just a couple more points on learning. As I mentioned, you are all our next generation highly skilled workforce. When you graduate, you're meant to be educated for our future. You're supposed to be coming out of college ready to create the future for us. I realize today you're just thinking about getting to graduation and possibly just your first internship job. But I want to give you um, a, a, a statistic I just heard. I just heard that a statistic that in the STEM-related field, only 15% of what we know today will be relevant in five years. Well, I'm not sure I completely agree with that statistic. I do agree that the change that we're seeing in technology is rapid. It's huge, and it's changing each and every day. So think about this a little bit differently. You're all sitting here today thinking about graduation in four or five years. Think about it differently. You'll be retiring in 2060 or somewhere around that time. I just mentioned we don't know what the world's going to look like in five to ten years, but no one can imagine what the world will look like in 45 years. I truly believe that learning is power in this innovation economy versus the current phrase that you hear, knowledge is power. And what I mean by that is it's how are you going to continue to renew yourself and to change yourself and keep yourself on edge. I think about the changes I've seen since I graduated. When I graduated in 1984, who would have thought that the HP 41CV which was our engineering calculator, would be basically non-existent. How many of you in the audience know what I'm talking about? How many professors know what I'm talking about? We carried this. This was our Bible. I mean, it was how we did our work. But um, also, if I think about the changes that I've also seen, we saw the move from analog to digital right in front of my eyes. To reflect on that, we went from the vacuum tube to the transistor, to the integrated circuit, what's next? And then I think about today. Who would have thought back then that we would be driving electric cars and that we would be developing 
cars of the future with autonomy. I mean, cities, designing cities that will have no human drivers in it. It's not something we would have ever thought about. I'll even go to the example of Apple. Who would have thought of the Apple iPad or the Apple iPhone that we could carry all of our music with us in a little sexy little project, I mean, or a package? I mean, that's incredible to see how the technology has changed. And you think of Uber, Facebook, the Internet of Things. When I was sitting in the, sh the, in the chairs that you guys are sitting on, we wouldn't be thinking about that. We live in an ever-changing world with data at our fingertips. And keeping on top of that pace of change in technology will be your opportunity. So I ask you to think about this. How will you keep yourself challenged, continue to learn, and not allow yourself to become comfortable? I found that throwing myself into new adventures help. And I would tell you, right now is the perfect time while you're here in college to figure out how to find fun in learning. So that leads me to my reflection, too. We talked a little bit about the need for confidence and courage, but you also have to have the ability to look beyond yourself and your career goals. To be a team player is absolutely crucial. And I love what I heard today because I see that you guys are working in a lot of team activities. I encourage you to get very engaged. And it's not about you know, getting consensus or a group hug or anything like that. It's about you being the best that you can be. Because the complex problems that we face today require a team. So it will require you to own your own responsibility and be good at what you do, but also understand the system or the problem that you're working and jumping in and making sure you're helping the weakest link of the problem. It's about the team. It's about the success of the project. It's not about the individual. At NASA, each space mission was a clear reminder of what teamwork was all about. You can't launch a mission on your own. And you really understood what your responsibility was and also how you could help make sure the overall success was there. It also, I learned when I was at NASA that there is a really important proverb that I use all the time. It's an African proverb. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Let me use another example of working at NASA. Bringing together the teams of engineers, astronauts, and cosmonauts from the United States and Russia was no easy task. If you remember, you know, we were competitors in the race for space for so, so many years. And I believe both the Russians and the U.S. for a period of time said, we're really not going to have to work together. But once we knew that was the case, and we started out very, very slow, but once we started building trust with each other, and we actually got through the language barriers and the distance that we were um, apart from each other, it started kind of working. For me, though, one of the scariest moments um, during the space program days for me was when I was standing in one of the Russian manufacturing facilities. It was Energia. And we were evaluating the Mir docking adapter, which the shuttle would need to dock with. We're all leaning over this table. There's no computers around. And we're looking at the drawing of the docking adapter. This was the master blueprint of the Mir docking adapter. And it had pencil and eraser marks on it. All I could think about was how on earth are we ever going to make this work? Because the Mir docking adapter was in space, and we're going to have to connect with it. Well, fast forward, and I'll show you this picture. Um, this is STS-71, which was the successful docking of the Russian Mir, um, with the shuttle um, docking to the Russian Mir space station. And it was also NASA's 100th um, manned mission. But it worked. I will tell you, we designed it much more robust than it ever needed to be. But we came together as a team and realized if we were going to keep this program together, that we had to be successful as one team. And that shuttle Mir precursor program was absolutely essential to the success of the International Space Station. So as I think about that, when we move forward to the International Space Station program, we had now built trust on, with each other, and we learned that the Russians really understood long-term duration. We, as the Americans, had always done 13, 16-day missions. And so how you approach things, both from a design perspective as well as training your astronauts and cosmonauts, is very different. But we took the best of both. 
Likewise, the Russians were very good at building and testing things, and we were very good at our analytical method, making sure it was optimized and so forth. But we figured out where it made sense to do the best of both methods, and today we have an international space station in the sky because of it. We came together like never before, and I truly believe it was a true success. To this day, when I look at the night sky and I happen to be out there when you see the International Space Station fly by, I still have that feeling of pride, yet unbelievable um, anxiety that I had when I remember standing in Kazakhstan. It was November 18, 1998. It was midnight. It was 36 hours before the first element um, was going to launch in Kazakhstan for the International Space Station. But I got the opportunity to stand out there and touch that missile right before it went off. It was unbelievable. But yet the anxiety of, is it going to work? Did we do everything right? Took over. Again, I'll come back to teamwork. Being a team player makes you smarter. It makes you more effective because your colleagues benefit from your, their experience and your experience and to collect, collectively, you get much, that much stronger. I also believe that it's a perfect way to stretch yourself by getting people that are smarter than you around you. The more you can surround yourself with smarter people, it keeps you on your toes. So get comfortable very quickly. Think about it. How many times have you sat in a room or worked on a project where you had an idea and you're thinking, why don't they ask me? I have a great idea. I'll guarantee you there's someone else who's sitting there asking the same thing. And you can learn from them, and they can learn from you. Being a team player also defines you as a leader. Building confidence and trust in others will demonstrate your true leadership capabilities. I would not be standing here today if it wasn't for the number of teams I've gotten to work with, from their experience, their expertise, their push to me. They stretched me in ways I never thought possible. And I believe I was able to bring influence and capabilities and inspire them to be their very best. So be a team leader. It will define you as a leader. I'd like to come to one last statement before I leave my topic on, um, on teamwork. And I'd like you to think about this statement as an individual, as a professional, and as a leader. Your smile is your logo. Your personality is your business card. How you leave others feeling after an experience will become your trademark. To be part of a team, to be the best, you have to be transparent. Creating trust will pay dividends. Reflection three. Make engineering your powerful advantage coupled with two required skills, entrepreneur skill, entrepreneurship and creative storytelling. As I mentioned earlier, the future is unknown, but what an opportunity for those that actually have all three of these skills, especially in this new innovation economy. Critical thinking, it's basically your engineering foundation that you are learning today. Engineering is teaching you how to think rather than memorize, like so many other fields of study. Many others will be graduating outside of engineering, have learned how to memorize yesterday's answers with yesterday's technologies. You're learning the analytical tools. You're learning the technical acumen, the ability to do methodical um, decisions, fact-based processes, rational reasoning. And you're using your intellectual curiosity to continue to learn. I know through all of your research projects and your teams, you're developing the ability to search out a range of different possibilities to a challenge or an opportunity. And you're also learning how to prototype different solutions and answers to those problems. So let your passion for the unknown, your problem-solving skills, your fact-based approach, your intellectual curiosity be your strength. Make engineering your first powerful advantage. I tell you, most people don't have the problem-solving skills that you will when you graduate from college. Entrepreneurship is your second skill. It's about having deep, it's not about just having a deep um, expertise in one area. It's about having the ability to have the broad understanding of how to take an idea and transition it into an innovative um, success. And what I mean by that is to have the ability to construct a business plan, to be able to think about the profit and loss, to be able to think about the balance sheet. You don't have to be an expert in these areas, 
but you've got to be able to have a solid understanding of a business plan and how to use financial and other leaders to help you take that idea forward. Your ability to be able to paint the big picture, the vision, you know, where you're taking this is really key to be able to influence and inspire others so that they see what you see and be able to move that forward and have that general understanding of the structure, the steps, and the required culture of a teamwork to take that idea to that successful innovation. And I'm not just talking about an entrepreneur for a startup company, while wow, this is important, or, or a technology company. To be successful in a large corporation, it is the entrepreneur skills that you will see climbing the ladder in the large corporations. Or they're the ones that are able to secure the funding for their idea or they're the ones that are able to get the talent to come join them on their teams. So those skills are critically important as you advance. And third, creative storytelling. If you believe the currency of the future is ideas, as I do, an individual's ability to be able to present an idea and to be able to demonstrate that value and to influence others is absolutely critical. And so, Having verbal and written storytelling skills is essential. You'll have to be able to put your project plan forward. You're going to have to be able to get up and talk to people and tell them why this is a great idea or why they want to buy your project or whatever you might be doing. Absolutely critical. And today, the, the stereotype engineer is not known for having these types of skills. They're known for lacking these skills unable to get out of the weeds, down into the details, explaining the what and how, you know, lacking the ability to really influence and inspire others with why, why this matters. And so what I'd ask you guys to do while you're here, and I know the entrepreneurship program and some of the things you're doing with communications, is take the time to learn it. Don't fall into that trap. And I know in a lot of cases that statement of a stereotype engineer is absolutely wrong but let's make sure we prove them wrong. And let's make sure you align yourself with a good communications leader, with um, the ability to practice your elevator speech, because it takes time and it takes practice. And I think um, Mark Twain says it best, and I think I skipped one. Um, Mark Twain says it best when he says, if I would have had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. It takes time to do it, and I'll just tell a real quick story. As a young engineer, I got the opportunity to go talk to the Air Force about a really important technical program we were working on. Unfortunately, we were facing a lot of complex problems, and so going to talk was not going to be an easy task, so I put my pitch together. I you know, presented it to my upper management, and I thought I was ready. So I walk in there, not more than five minutes into my presentation, um, the lieutenant colonel who was sitting at the opposite end of the table said to me, you got five minutes because you're wasting my time to get to your point and get to your request. I'll still remember those words to this day. And let me tell you, it wasn't a pretty, I stopped cold in my tracks, went to my summary, and uh, got out of there. But the best thing is, it never happened to me again. And when we were facing on the International Space Station program, um, trying to keep the program alive, those who followed the program or the parents pro followed the program, we got down to only winning by one vote in Congress. And we had to put together a pitch, which was to keep the space station alive. I was asked with four other engineers to work on this pitch. We locked ourselves up in this co small conference room. We basically had a war room in which we were presenting. It took us basically two weeks. I'm not sure if it was exactly that time, but it felt like a long time. But we got it down to what we called to the six-pack, the NASA six-pack. And we, I think it was a beautiful pitch on six pages that told the value of the International Space Station. And anyone knows who knows how complex the International Space Station, it was a tough thing to do to get it into six pages. Bottom line is we got the funding that we needed and the program today is up in the sky. But getting that right, taking the time, it's well worth it. Because to see people that have these three skills is rare. And if you have it, in my mind, it will determine how fast and how far your career will open up for you. And I also rely on those three skills when we got the opportunity to successfully um, spin off Xylem from ITT. I could spend hours up here talking about that once in a lifetime opportunity to be able to separate a company, to then stand up a company, 
to be able to build a new culture for the team to be excited about the employee base, to make sure you didn't miss, uh, miss a beat with your customers, and then also make sure you had the trust with your investors. It required each one of those skills, not only for me to have it, but my leadership team to have it. And it was a once in a lifetime opportunity. To know what we went through, you have to live through, but it was a great time, but it was a lot of long hours, and Grant, who's in the room with me, remembers those days. So let me move on to reflection four. Stay in your rookie mode. It produces your greatest work. And so what do I mean by staying in the mode of a behavior of a rookie? To me, it's how you tend to think and act when you're mindful of doing something for the first time. Go, I'll go back to the point that I made. It's that tension between your butterflies and that confidence in your stomach um, that makes your greatest work. But before I go any further, um, I got the opportunity to work with a woman, Liz Wiseman, and she wrote a book called Rookie Smart and it's really worthwhile. So she's helped in this concept in terms of what I'm talking about. And I'll, I'll go back to a, a story again. A, it was a communication story, but I remember when I was first asked to present my first technical paper um, on the characteristics of composite materials. That was my um, kind of major in mechanical engineering or my, my discipline, and I had done some work as an intern um, to further that, and my professor came up and asked me, you know, I'd like you to present this paper. To make it worse, it was to go present this paper at a conference in Las Vegas. Well, who wants to go to Las Vegas when you're in college to an engineering conference? I'm sure that's not one of your first ideas. Plus, I was petrified of public speaking. I hadn't done it before, and I was scared to death. And to make it even worse, the people that were going to be in the audience weren't students like myself. They were industry experts. And so I was petrified. But, of course, it's a rookie moment. It's an opportunity to prove to myself I can do something, so I went to work. I channeled my energy, and I went back and read my research. I went and met with some of the experts that I had worked with, and I read, and I read, and I practiced, and I practiced, and then that big day arrived. And I remember walking in that conference room and walking up to the podium, shaking, nervous, sweating, you know, the whole thing. But I will tell you, I started out, I was nervous, I stumbled a little bit, and then I gained confidence as I went. But then came to me what was the scariest part, which was the question and answer session. You know, what were they going to ask me? What if I didn't know the answer? What was I going to do? But thankfully, all the preparation that I had done and hard work really kicked in. I was able to answer the questions. We had a great dialogue with the audience, and I met some great uh, colleagues that I kept in contact for many years later. Um, but I will tell you, when you study, when you prepare, when you push yourself, you'll be the best that you can be. It doesn't mean you won't make a mistake, but to me, that was an incredible rookie experience for me. And so when I talk about a rookie experience, think about the first time you've done something that was important that was really tough situation, whether it's something from school, whether it was the first time you dove off the diving board, something that was important to you. How'd you feel? I know when I was there, I was excited, I was unencumbered, un um, but I was also very anxious, I was nervous. How did I operate? I asked a lot of questions, um, I was quick because I didn't want to take too long, I wanted to go, I wanted to get this thing done, I wanted to demonstrate I could do it but gathering and seeking out information and learning the whole entire time. And what did I do when I didn't know an answer? I'd go ask someone. I'd get advice. And what was my aspiration? Of course it was to win. It was to succeed. It was to demonstrate not only to myself, but to others that I could do something. And so I think that mode is a perfect mode to create your best work. So many times when we become veterans in our working and in our thinking, we change our behavior. You know, we tend to go more in the protect, protect, um, protective mode. We tend to um, think of ourselves as experts where we need to advise versus getting advised, and we stop learning and listening from others. We tend to stop questioning the status quo. And when we were younger and a rookie, we kind of had that need for speed, and you think about it more from a marathon, I'm going to be steady, steady state, I'm not going to take that risk, we've got plenty of time to think it out. Don't lose that rookie moment. And I will tell you that I got the opportunity to stay in that rookie moment because I got the opportunity to change jobs and challenge myself many, many times. How many of you really want a job that you know how to do? 
that you know you truly are qualified for. So think about how you keep yourself on the edge. With that said, never stop listening. I truly believe God gave us two ears and one mouth for a real reason. And so remember this. Listening requires suspending judgment. It's hard to do a lot of times. But to hear someone out at length and in depth before you shift into action or to shift into your argument is so critically important. Never react to the naysayers and do what you think is right. But I will tell you by listening, you'll learn something from them, whether it's just in how you present your idea because you now know where people are resisting your idea or they actually change your idea and make you stronger and better at what you do. Also, get comfortable with making mistakes. Good judgment comes from experience, but experience comes from bad judgment. And we all make mistakes, and you will, and feel okay about that. It's embarrassing at times, but guess what? You'll learn more from your mistakes, and they will guide you in the future more than your success. But remember this one quote from George S. Patton. Am I on the right page? I'm not. Yeah, I yeah. am. Okay. Success is how high you bounce. Um, when you hit the bottom. Think about that. It's so true. It's how you deal with those failures that you have and how you lose that. And the other thing, I didn't put it on here, but also remember, stay grounded as a rookie. Avoid the words of an unknown Navy admiral, which says, rookies are all thrust and no vector. But this is what I say to him. That's where your leadership, that's where your teachers, that's where your mentors, that's where your team comes into play and makes you better. So now for my last reflection. Find meaning in what you do. Make it matter. To me, you have to have meaning in what you're doing. And if you're working for an organization, you have to believe in what they do. Again, I'll go back to another proverb that I like, which is certain things catch your eye, but pursue only those that capture your heart. Many people that I talk to, many your age, tell me that for you to be able to have a positive social impact, that you have to work for a nonprofit organization. I would tell you I completely disagree. Now, I love nonprofit organizations, and there's a purpose, and if you go work for them, great. I think there's great opportunity there. But don't think you can't do some of the, things, the same things for corporations. I've seen firsthand how effective companies can really provide social value, not only in their products and the services that they're providing, but also in their um, social, uh, corporate um, responsibility and finance, uh, philanthropy initiatives. I truly believe large corporations, when you get them focused, they've got such deep reach and deep resources that when they get engaged on a social impact um, activity, they really move the needle. And I'd love to see the energy, the commitment, the use of technology that you all know bring that to a corporation, and help them be able to make a huge impact. I encourage all of you guys to think about working for a corporation at some point in your career. Um, as millennials, as I just mentioned, there is such an opportunity that you guys have at your fingertips in how to connect the world. It would have a profound impact for large corporations. They are changing, probably slower than they need to, but honestly, they need the talent that are sitting here in this room. To me, the key is to find a company whose mission you truly believe in and whose leaders you believe in. And it's also important to understand your role and how you can help advance um, that mission. In my career, I've had the opportunity um, to really get involved and help companies engage with their, com with their employees and to connect with their mission. In fact, to me, it's something I'm truly passionate about because I truly believe an organization can't move forward can't drive progress, and can't be the best it can be unless their people believe in them and their people believe that they truly can make a difference. During my time at CEO at Xylem, you know, as I mentioned, I got the opportunity to pull the company apart from ITT and build um, a leading international water technology company. But I also got the privilege to actually help create our Watermark um, program, which was really our company's corporate citizenship, and social investment program. And I'd like to share, you a, story, share a story with you um, that had profound impact on me. And I would tell you it's very similar to some of the service opportunities that each of you have, and I would really recommend that you take advantage of that while you're here at school. 
I was on a trip to Calcutta, India, um, where our Watermark partners were actually working with the local community um, where we were delivering new water solutions to the uh, community in dire need. We were going out to a very remote area where a school was being, um, um, we were bringing clean water and sanitation to the school. And it was so critical for this, the children because what was happening is too many children were dropping out of school and especially the girls as they were maturing in age. So we drove for hours outside of Calcutta and it was one of those days, it was hot and it was sticky and it was a long, long car ride. And when we finally arrived at that little village, um, we were greeted by this small group of um, children who were standing there. And it was truly moving. But really, when we walked around that corner, I was truly speechless. There were hundreds and hundreds of children cheering at us and actually throwing rose petals at our feet. And it just made you stop. So as we walked forward and we got to the center of that uh, play, uh, the, the schoolyard, the head teacher, which you can see in, in the one um, picture there, snapped his finger and there was not a noise to be, sa be heard in that group. And, and hundreds of children, not a noise. And then they sang a song for us. And then after they sang the song, this little girl came up to me and grabbed my hand and then she proceeded to walk me into the brand new little girl's restroom. And she was so excited to show me the taps that were on the sink and to show me the mirror that was on the wall. And I remember looking at that mirror and all I could see was this little girl behind me smiling, beaming, and she was so excited to be a little girl going to a school that had running water. And all I could see was this little girl with hope. I will tell you, it was an amazing part to be part of an organization that had a higher ambition, that was recognizing its role in helping people who need it the very, very most. It's amazing to work for a company you believe in and that does work that matters. And you have that opportunity. As an engineer, you get to choose where you get to pick, I mean, where you get to go. You have so many doors open. There's not enough engineers coming out of school. And so I just would tell you, take some time thinking about what you're interested in, what you like, and then taking time to find that job that matches. It will work perfectly. And it may take you a couple jobs to get there, but think about your career in those, in those lights. As I stated in my beginning of my remarks, your engineering ex exper um, expertise will position you perfectly to realize your dream or actually create your dream as you start opening some of these doors. With real life problem solving skills, you'll be able to uniquely you know, untangle and solve many of the complex problems. You'll, feel, you'll find some of the answers that we need to some of the pressing problems that are right here in front of our generation and actually start advancing new technologies that we need to position us in the future. So in closing, I'd like to go back to the painting of John Young um, that I had shown at the earlier. The look of his um, anticipation, his determination on his face before he left on his mission um, is incredible. We don't know exactly what his thoughts were at that moment, but we can only imagine and think about some of the things that we have experienced or that we will experience as we go forward. However, we do know what John Young felt like when he came back after 54 orbits in space and uh, 36, no, I, actually it was 54 days in orbit and 36 days, um, or 36 orbits later. When he landed that ship and we saw the first space shuttle flight come to a spectacular finish, John said, our dream is alive. I tell you, your dream is right in front of you. So push yourself, never stop learning, and give yourself the freedom to try new things. Build confidence and courage, yet be a team player. Make engineering your powerful advantage and couple that with entrepreneurship and creative um, storytelling, and I can tell you, your career will take off for you. And stay in your rookie mode. It will produce your greatest work and also find meaning in what you do. You work a lot, but you want to have fun with what you're doing and you want to be able to know you're leaving a legacy. And so with that, I would just say, I wish you all the best happiness and success on your time here on campus. I wish you success in your career endeavors. And uh, we need more engineers with your spirit, with your energy, uh, because there's a lot of open issues out there. And so as your school states, go ignite change. And thank you for your time. Questions? Yeah, sure. 
I'm open for any questions. It's a Friday, I know. Any thoughts? Over here. Hello? Oh, okay. Um, it's a little lower. Um, what's the best team you work with and why? That's a good question. I'm not sure I can say there's one team, but I will, I will, I will give you some characteristics of a team that I think um, that uh, work best. And I'll use two examples. NASA, NASA um, was one of them. Obviously, to, to uh, have a mission go off successfully, um, you really have to build trust with one another, uh, one another, and you really have to understand your responsibility, kind of the what's coming to you and what's leaving you and how that all works ultimately um, together. And NASA, I think, in, built that uh, teamwork probably better than anywhere I've ever worked before. Um, they challenge you, but you trusted each other, and so you would work hard and then you'd play hard. So you built this relationship with a person or with your team that was second to none. The other area I would um, talk about, and I'll use an example, I've used this in, in several of my talks before, is an example that comes to life, and, and Grant could probably tell the story even better than I can. But Godwin pumps, we bought Godwin pumps when we were at Xylem. You guys all remember the Sandy Storm. Here you have a team of people that uh, actually work 24-7. They would work around the clock helping their customers when there was water to remove that water because it wasn't needed, or ultimately um, in another situation that required moving water somewhere that it, it was away from where it was for the most part. This team was a team of uh, folks that here they were faced with their own homes being flooded, their own properties and their own families um, dealing with something. But they dropped all that to make sure that the team came together to help their customers. Here was a team that saw the forecast of the weather, and we had equipment spread across the whole U.S. They brought equipment all the way from um, uh, Washington, California, had it on trucks on its way here before we had any type of a purchase order from a customer and so forth. They did it because they knew it was the right thing to do. And they worked together, they picked up the phones, many of them got in their cars and came in this area to help them because they knew they wouldn't have enough people here to be able to support the area. And then they also helped each other when they got back to homes to be able to fix and, and solve their problems at home. It was just a team that became a family. I mean, what, there was just a trust and a belief in what they did that was just demonstrated in every action that they took. And so. You know, you don't always get the opportunity to work in an environment like that, but when you have it, it's a culture that is so deep and so rich that you will really stop what you're doing and that team comes first before your person. One more thing. How do you create an opportunity like that on a college campus? Do you have any advice for that? Well, you know, I think a couple things that you guys are doing that I heard about today was the FLIP program. Is that correct? Yeah. What is it? Yeah, the flip classroom where you guys are bringing teams together and you're actually working on projects and you're creating that environment on a project and so forth. Now's the time to learn it. Um, learn and be comfortable with being surrounded with people that are as smart as you or smarter or actually figure out where and how you understand your strengths and you also understand your weaknesses. All of, them, all of us have it at every level of our, our career progression. We're strong in certain areas and we're weaker in other areas. How can I surround myself with someone who can strengthen my weakness and I ultimately maybe can help them, help them in an area that they're not as strong? So I highly recommend teams at the earliest age. But with that said, don't lose your own individual accountability and responsibility. You still have a job to do, but you're doing that job in the context of the team. And so, I think it's so important to work that. And in college, a lot of times when I was going to school, it was very little teamwork. It was all about individual, your grades, your scores, so on and so forth. I think that's changed quite a bit from the many years ago that I went to college, but keep doing that. Other thoughts? Come on, am I going to get one question from some of the students? This is your opportunity. Shy group. Well, why don't we thank Gretchen again? Thank you very much. Thank you.